Good evening. All right. Happy Wednesday night. And Ephesians 3. So those of you that actually uh, are pulling up the notes, whether you're online looking at notes or you're here pulling up notes, they're awful. I just reviewed them and so much is like I'm not covering that and wow, that's the wrong spot for that. And Ruth has an H in it and I just wrote R-U-T. There's just a lot wrong with these notes. So do what you want with them, but they're poor. So now, but we will go to the flawless text of the Bible. Ephesians chapter 3, and as you remember, you know, this is a much more enthusiastic, positively enthusiastic book than Galatians. Galatians, he was totally fired up about getting the gospel wrong, right? He was even threatening angels with damnation if you change the gospel, right? Ephesians is much more, you can hear the, the positive enthusiasm of the apostle, you can hear his excitement. As I told you uh, last week, he's just going to have like these run-on sentences where he just won't pause for a period. He won't kind of take a breath. We're going to see that again tonight. And uh, in fact, if you look at the very beginning of chapter 3, Paul starts for this reason. And then he interrupts himself and doesn't pick up on that reason until verse 14. So he'll spend verses 2 to 13 interrupting himself about the reason just to get Uh, some excitement out of them. So now I'm going to do this study a little bit differently. It's still going to be verse by verse. We're going to cover every word of it. But chapter three is like this celebration of the inclusion of Gentiles into the plan of God. So with that celebration of Gentiles into the plan of God, and, and because chapter three is pretty short, and I didn't know how to keep you here for an hour based on it, we are going to celebrate this Gentile inclusion by looking at other areas of scriptures that I get excited about that look what God did there, including Old Testament celebrations of Gentiles. That's a pretty cool thing, right? So uh, let's pray and we'll get right into it. Father, in Jesus' name, we dedicate this time to you, Lord, and just pausing from our jobs, pausing from family, pausing from everything else that's uh, not directly you right now, Lord. And we want to focus directly in on you. And Lord, we pray that as you taught us uh, about the good soil of the heart that produces crops, we pray right now you would allow our hearts to be increasingly good soil, Lord, that that takes in your word as seed right now and produces uh, crops 30, 60, 100 fold, Lord, because your kingdom is great and greatly to be praised, Lord. And we want to uh, serve that kingdom here tonight. So help this group, Lord, be strengthened so they can go out and strengthen others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So chapter 3, verse 1 starts off. Paul says, for this reason, and the idea was, um, of course, the end of chapter 2 is this idea of God building his, his own dwelling place and that we're becoming these stones in that dwelling place. So Paul says, now for this reason, I... Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you, Gentiles, so you see, you know, this is what he's bringing up. Listen, I, Paul, am a prisoner of Christ Jesus for you, Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, so now He's saying, a mystery was revealed to me that I'm going to make known to you. He made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. All that to say what? What is this mystery? Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. So if you kind of consider for a moment the attitude of the Jew towards the Gentile throughout all Old Testament history, 
And that here's Paul, who not only was not for the Gentiles, he was actually not for the Christians, right? He was just very much for the Jew. And so now that man not only is a Christian, but he's a Christian who's going to massively celebrate the fact that God has a heart for the Gentiles, okay? So he says in verse 1, for this reason, and the reason isn't addressed until verse 14, where we pick up again, where he's going to say, for this reason. The reason is the unity of Jew and Gentile in Christ. That's the revealed mystery. Now, Paul, you see at the, in verse 1, it says, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. Then you get this hyphenated line where he interrupts himself. And he says, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God. And he's going to talk about that dispensation of the grace of God being a dispensation to the Gentiles now. So he's saying, if you heard that, okay, he says, I briefly mentioned it before. So in other words, his language is very broken up and subdivided here, okay? <clears throat> he's stopping himself because he gets another thought and stops himself because he gets another thought. First of all, that's evidence that he's using an amanuensis. He's using a scribe, okay? People don't write like this. They don't write a thought and then stop not erase it, but keep going and interrupt themselves in their writing. But they will do that in speech, won't they? Okay. Now, when high emotion interrupts your speech, that is actually uh, something we call, um, I don't want to mispronounce this like I always, always do. So I'm looking for where, oh, there it is. It's called apasiopesis. Say it with me. Apasiopesis. Oh, wow, that was better than I did. All right. Apasiopesis. Apasiopesis is interrupted speech because of high emotion. So you ever get like such high emotion that it's like, I, I don't even know how, how, I don't even know what to, I, I don't, I don't even know how to express how I feel right now. You know, it's like interrupting your own speech because of high emotion. That's what Paul's going through. Um, You see that in Psalm 139 with King David. You know, King David, uh, in, in the first few verses, uh, starts talking about... I love when I bring something up and then realize I'm not recalling the verses. So in Psalm 139, um, he'll say, you know, there's not a word on my tongue, O Lord, but behold, you know it all together. You hedged me in behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot a attain it. And the word attain was added in by the scribes. It wasn't there. It just, I cannot, it, is what was written by David. Apostiopesis. He's experiencing this high emotion that's interrupting his speech. All right? Apostle Paul, we see that here as well. Now, verses 2 through 13 are the break in that speech. Because he's excited to reveal to you this mystery. So he starts in verse 1 to introduce this mystery, interrupts himself, and doesn't pick it up again really fully to verse 14. So let's read some more, starting in verse 8, of what he's so excited about. Now Paul says, to me, and this high emotion, this excitement, he says, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints. Why? Why? Because the rest of the saints were not bit as big an enemy to this movement as he was, right? He started from way underneath them. It's a tremendous persecutor of the very movement he's promoting now. He says, so to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given. So in other words, if God's grace can come to me, don't anybody ever say that you're not worthy of the grace of God. Well, say that. That's fine. You're not worthy of the grace of God. But don't say he won't give me grace because of who I am. Paul always stands as, you ain't him, and he got the grace, okay? So it's unconditional. So to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given. Why? That I should preach among the Gentiles. In other words, grace never comes to anybody without a purpose for that grace being dispensed elsewhere. You're not a, you're not a storage house for grace where you get grace and you just go, lucky me, lucky me. That grace is intended to go out to, to others. So I just sat with a young lady um, this afternoon who lost 
her boyfriend to sudden death uh, in May. And as it's June, July, August, now September, these four months of her grieving that, um, as an unbeliever, she lost him as an unbeliever, and now she's starting to see what God's been doing these last four months, and she's realizing God's working in her a character that she never would have had without this loss and an understanding. Okay, this is really quite a God story that, um, you know, obviously I can't unpack right now. But this was a, a, a guy that I, I think I told this story already, but this is a guy who I've been working with for years and years through drug addictions and joblessness and things like that. And I'm driving him to the hospital because he had his jaw broken. And his girlfriend called, who I didn't even know he had a girlfriend, but I hear her speaking. And the only things I hear her say on this Saturday that I'm with this kid is when she realizes he's being driven to the hospital, she says, I'm coming because I want to be where you are. So I just heard that. Two days later, he dies. And so then we reach out to her through his cell phone because I'm like, he had a girlfriend that nobody knew about because there's detachment from the family. He has a girlfriend that nobody knew about. We get his cell phone. We find the time that I heard them talking, call that number and break the news to her that her boyfriend's dead because he was living homeless at the time. So she didn't know. So, um, and so the first time that I met with her, I said to her, do you know the only words I heard you say to him is I want to be where you are? I said, so do you know that I feel like that that's my role in your life now is to show you how you can be where he is now? Okay, because he's in heaven. You know, and um, so it's just an incredible story. And um, so anyways, do you remember why I brought that up? Yeah, okay, good. I did too. I was testing you. Okay. All right. I did too. I was testing you. You passed. All right. (laughs) All right. What a good point I made. That was good. Okay, yeah. Now... Okay. So to me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given. Why? Why has God given me this grace? That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, when I see language like that, the apostle who knows about the riches of Christ better than I do, and he describes them as unsearchable. So here's what my mind does with that category. Whatever joy I get over the riches of Christ... I have to know it's still better than that, right? Because Paul said they're unspeakable. These are unspeakable riches. So even Paul, who knows more about them, is unable to verbally communicate them to anybody. So he just says this, they're unspeakable, okay? They're better than we can articulate. It's like he says, it's not even entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who loved him. Nobody's heart has ever received how actually great the things that God has prepared for us are. So it's never even entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for you, okay? So whatever awesome moment you had thinking of heaven, just know this, you sold it short. You did. It's better than that, okay? So he says, the the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery. So now he's giving you a hint of what the mystery is. There's a fellowship involved with this mystery, right? The fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ. Do you have that picture of Jesus Christ as creator? Because it's all throughout the scriptures that Jesus Christ is the creator. Here it is right here. God created through whom? Jesus Christ. How so? (laughs) He created through the spoken word, correct? What does John call him? The word. What does Paul say in Colossians about creation through the word? It says, all things were made through him, Jesus Christ. And without him, nothing was made that was made. It's been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ to the intent. So there's an intent behind all of this. The intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. Do you need a reason to go to church on Sunday? The church is supposed to be making these things known. Made known by the church. To who, though? Okay. Now, I was reminded earlier that we ended on an awkward question last week about the giants in the land and and, and things like that, and we didn't have time to unpack it. So I just want to say tonight, we're not going to have time to unpack that either. Maybe we will. We'll see. But what does this say now? 
made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. It's being made known to the principalities and powers, these governing authorities in the heavenly places. I want to increase your awareness of this heavenly realm. Of principality. Paul will warn you against principalities and powers of darkness in higher places, right? Okay? It's not, it's not God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and you. There's an enemy. There's an evil force that says is governing. They're rulers. There's a, there's a spiritual realm of evil rulers out there. Okay? Uh, that's why Paul tells you to put on your armor. Okay? Why? You're in battle. You have enemies. Okay? So now the church is to make known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places according to the eternal purpose. There's a purpose that will never, ever, ever, ever end. There's an eternal purpose to what's going on here. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and we have access with confidence through faith in him. So how did God accomplish this through Christ Jesus? Christ Jesus took care of absolutely everything and then says, through your faith in him, it's, it's yours. These unspeakable riches are yours and you have access through faith in him to everything that Christ has done. Okay? Through everything that Christ has done, you have access to these unspeakable riches and this fellowship that now includes all people in the world who believe. That's always the condition that's laid out, isn't it? I mean, I got to find something on the, online that tells us how many times we're told for you who believe or for you who are in Christ, you know, and all these things. That's the condition. Therefore, okay, therefore I ask you, do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is for your glory. Listen, Paul speaks of these unspeakable riches, things that are too good to be understand, understood fully by humanity. And he's in jail suffering. And he says, listen, if you knew what I knew, then you'd realize this suffering ain't no big deal. This suffering is a, is a blip in the road towards me fulfilling the eternal purpose for which I was called. And I'm not sitting here going... Hey, if I knew it ended up like this, I never would have done it. Okay, that's not ever entering the heart or the mind of Paul because in his mind clearly is the unspeakable riches of Christ which makes jail terms and eventual beheading no big deal. So what could it be? What could Paul possibly know that makes his own beheading no big deal? Totally worth it. We have to understand he's been given some revelation where he says to be able to speak that the way the Lord wants me to speak it, I'll cut my life short, okay? To not speak it and live a full life will be far less than having my life cut off and being able to speak it. So what must this information be? What must this vision that he had of heaven be? Because remember, he was given a vision of the third heaven, right? Okay, he was given that vision. And he said, it's literally humanly impossible to not brag and brag and brag and brag about what I saw. So God had to give me a messenger of Satan to torment me just to make sure I stayed humble. What could this information be? Okay. So heaven is better than you've ever been told. Heaven is better than you've ever imagined. Every great thing about heaven um, has been undersold by every pastor, preacher, everybody that's ever spoken on it. It's better than that. It's better than that. But you don't know what I've heard. It doesn't matter. It's not entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Now, so because of this, these unspeakable riches of Christ, because of these unspeakable riches of Christ, Paul's going to break out into a prayer here. And we're going to read this prayer and then we're going to celebrate with Paul this revealed mystery. So the prayer starts in verse 14. He picks up his thought from verse 1 now. And he says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. Apostiopesis here, right? You see the hyphen? Interrupting his own speech. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now when Paul says, don't lose heart at my tribulations for you, the good news makes prison and punishment no big deal. When you live for self, your tribulations are to yourself and they become devastating in the perspective that you have because you're so small, your tribulations are going to seem huge. But when your perspective is Christ and his work on our behalf and the riches that he's prepared for us who love him, and I don't mean material riches, I mean spiritual riches, then your tribulations become right-sized and manageable. And they're proof that you're a spiritual warrior. Paul finishes by saying, now to him who's, well, I'm going to save that for the end. So we'll stop right here for a minute. Now, so Paul wants to reveal this mystery, and now he breaks out into a prayer that you would somehow comprehend this, that God will grant you strength in the inner man, that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, will be able to comprehend this great love of Christ, which passes knowledge. So what's making him celebrate this great love of Christ? It's other people's salvation. It's the Gentiles, okay? Those who, as a rabbinical Jew, he would have saw as his enemy. He would have saw as the rejected ones of God. Now he's saying, oh my goodness, look what God has done. And he breaks out into the celebration. So I want to celebrate with him. And here's how I want to celebrate. I want you to consider, first of all, that we see this Gentile salvation plan of God in the Old Testament, starting, well, not starting, but the first place we're going to go is Joshua 2. Joshua 2, we have the story of Rahab. Again, not just a Gentile, but a Gentile woman, not just a Gentile woman, but a Gentile woman harlot, okay? The one that, as a, as, as a child of God, you and I probably would have walked right past and snickered at, right? While God is loving on her and revealing himself to her, we pick it up in verse 8. This is when she's hiding the spies on the roof. Verse 8, now before they lay down, she came up on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came up out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. We heard and our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Did you catch that statement? See Rahab through hearing the very things that made their hearts fear and melt. What's the reaction she had when she heard? She heard and believed, right? She's come to faith. And here's her confession. The Lord your God, he is God in heaven and above and in earth beneath. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house 
and give me a true token and spare my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters and all they have and deliver our lives from death. So the men answered her. Like you imagine a Gentile harlot woman in ancient Israel, Gentile woman in ancient Israel or in Jericho, but talking to Israelite men, asking them to make a covenant with her. Make a covenant with me that even though you have orders to destroy us, you'll go against those orders and you'll spare us because I believe in your God. So the men answer her, our lives for yours, if none of you tell this business of ours. And it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. Then she let them down by a rope through the window for her house was on the city wall. She dwelt on the wall. And she said to them, get to the mountain lest the pursuers meet you. Hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Afterward, you may go on your way. Now these men pledge faithfulness to Rahab even though she's condemned by the law of Moses as a Canaanite who's to be killed. She's under the curse of Noah who cursed, when he cursed Shem, he said, cursed be Canaan. And she's a Canaanite. She's a woman, and she's a harlot. She has four major strikes against her, yet these men enter covenant with her. Why? Because Rahab has a remarkable faith. Her faith makes his grace sufficient for her. Her faith made his grace sufficient for her. A covenant has the power to overcome the law. It's how Gentiles are saved. It's a new covenant in the blood of Christ, correct? Is overcoming the fact that God chose Jacob as his inheritance. He chose Israel as his inheritance. And we who are outside of that choice of inheritance are in the covenant by faith. Faith overcomes, uh, covenants overcome the law. And they're entered into by faith, as Rahab did. So the men said to her, we will be blameless of this oath of yours which we have, you have made us swear unless when we come into the land you bind this line of scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And unless you bring your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household to your own home. So it shall be whoever goes outside the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head and we will be guiltless. And whoever is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid on him. And if you tell this business of ours, then we will be free from your oath which you made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Now, it's a scarlet cord on the door that whoever's behind that door with the scarlet cord will live, correct? Whoever's outside that door will die. Think back to Noah's ark. God told them to make a singular door on that ark. And whoever's in that door will live. Whoever's outside that door will die. Think of Passover. You're to sprinkle blood on the doorposts of your house. And whoever's in the door with the blood on the doorpost will live. Whoever's outside will die. You see the pattern? In John 10, Jesus says, I am the door. Whoever's in me will live. Whoever's outside of me will die. He's that door. Okay? So... Gentile Rahab, and like I said, just like Paul was just not some Jewish guy becoming Christian, he was a Jewish guy who hated Christians and was responsible for their arrest and their deaths who became a Christian. Rahab is not just a Gentile who's included in the covenant. She's a Gentile woman, harlot, who, because of her faith, is welcomed into the covenant of God. Okay, it's a sample, it's, a, it's an immediate fulfillment of what God is going to ultimately fulfill through Christ, the inclusion of the Gentiles. How about Ruth? The, the two greatest examples of Gentile inclusion into the covenant of God in the Old Testament are women, by the way. That book that just hates women, right? Okay. It's women that are the greatest shining examples of God's love for the Gentile. 
Ruth. Let's pick it up in chapter 1, verse 11. So it starts with Bethlehem is in famine. Famine is a sign of sin because God prevents the sun and the rain from producing the crops because that land is in sin. And until they repent, he withholds food from them. Then when they cry out to him, he he produces the food again. Well, there's famine in Bethlehem, which is very ironic because Bethlehem means house of bread. And what's lacking in the house of bread? Bread. So the story starts with there being no bread in the house of bread. Why? Sin. There's sin in the land. Okay? So Elimelech and his wife Naomi take their two sons, Malon and and Kilion, and they go to Moab, enemy territory, because there's food in Moab. Okay? Now, verse 11, oh, by verse 11, they hear that God has brought food to Bethlehem again. So Naomi lost her husband, Elimelech. She lost her two daughters, about a 10 year, or two sons, uh, over a 10 year period. And now she just has her two daughters in law. And now she wants to go back to Bethlehem. But she tells the girls, hey, Jewish guys aren't going to be too thrilled with you. So you're probably not going to find a husband there. So the one daughter says, then I'm out. And she stays. But this is the story of Ruth in that situation. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, and go. For I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So you see the different reactions there. And she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. That's the worst statement of the book. Do you ever tell somebody to turn back to their false gods that can offer them no hope whatsoever? Right? But Ruth said, this is one of the great speeches in all of Scripture. One of the great speeches in all of Scripture. Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. You hear the confession of faith? Where you die, I will die and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also if anything but death parts you and me. Do you hear the marital language there? Till death do us part, she's saying, right? Nothing will come between us till death do us parts because your God is my God. Now, um, so Ruth had good reasons to go back to Moab, but she cannot overcome the God reasons for staying with Naomi. Anybody can tell the difference between a good and a bad decision, but only the wise can tell the difference between a good and a better decision, right? That requires wisdom, and that's what Ruth does. So here we have another Gentile brought into the family of God in the Old Testament. Now, there's some remarkable New Testament celebrations of Gentile salvation. We start in Mark chapter 7. I love this story of the Syrophoenician woman. Uh, Mark 7, starting at verse 24, we read, From there Jesus arose and went into the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and wanted no one to know it. Good luck with that, Jesus, right? He wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. A Syrophoenician woman bothers Jesus when he wants to be left alone. I wonder how he's going to handle that. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she kept asking him to cast a demon out of her daughter. Now watch how uncharacteristic Jesus' response seems to be. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. What did he just call her? Little dog. 
Okay? Now that's what, how they referred to Gentiles. That's how the Jews felt about Gentiles. They would call them dogs. And Jesus is saying, listen, I'm working with the Jews right now. Let them be filled first. It's not right to take what I'm here to give them and give it to the little dogs. Now, he's doing it to provoke a response in her because he sees her faith. He sees Gentile faith in this woman. So now he's going to use this woman's faith as a Gentile to rebuke the fickle faith of the Jews. So he, he makes that statement fully aware of how she's going to respond. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. That's all I need are your crumbs. I don't need to be invited to sit at your table. I just know that if crumbs fall from your table, if I can have that, my daughter will be healed. You hear that, Faith? I don't need a great work from you. I don't need you to come to the house. I don't need anything. If I know that I got a crumb from you today, then my daughter, who I'm fighting tooth and nail for, for her life, I'll walk away knowing she'll be better. How does she know Jesus that way? How does she know Jesus that way? And Jesus said to her, for this saying, go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. As she's speaking, Jesus drives that demon out from that distance. Okay? Remarkable Gentile faith with her daughter's life on the line. She's willing to say that. Now you all have seen Last Supper paintings over and over and over again, usually just by one artist, correct? Okay, Da Vinci, right? You see his great Last Supper painting. But other artists have made paintings of the Last Supper as well. And my favorite is a picture of the Last Supper with the apostles around the table with Jesus. And the first thing I like about it is it's more realistic because they're actually sitting around the table. It's not 12 guys cramming on one single side of the table. This is very unrealistic. But they're sitting around the table and they're having the Last Supper. And when you look under the table, there's a dog licking up crumbs from that table. That artist is capturing this story. And he's saying that the Gentiles are invited to this supper feast of the Lord where he's offering his body and his blood to be eaten. And the, the dog under the table is saying, Gentiles are welcome to sit at this table. Isn't that a remarkable painting? Okay. Now, uh, the last time I said that, I actually had some friends in the audience who came back with a remarkable painting of that painting. It's hanging on my classroom wall now. It's really remarkable. I love sharing that with the kids. All right, now. Also, we see in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 5, a Roman centurion. So here's a guy not only overcoming his Gentileness to have faith, but also his position, uh, his profession, he's overcoming his duty to actually keep these people in check to bow his knee to the Jewish God here. Uh, 8.5 says, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. It's another way of showing a different type of faith. He doesn't say, listen, I already told the Syrophoenician woman, man, you get the crumbs, I'm dealing with the Jews right now. He doesn't say that. This time he's provoking response by saying, okay, I'll come heal him because here's what happens. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Now, how does he know that? He says in verse 9, For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And if I say to this one, go, he goes. And to another, come, he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. He said, listen, I'm a man who has people under my authority, and I know when I speak, they listen. So what's he really saying? I know your authority, and if you speak, I know he'll be healed. I know that the disease that's troubling my servant is under your command. So I just need you to speak the word. That's why these people are in our scriptures. 
because they get it. They're our example. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. There's very little that we see in the scriptures that make Jesus marvel, but this Gentile faith does. Jesus marveled and said to those who followed, listen to what he says about this. He says, Assurely, he's saying to his Jewish followers, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west. You want to see what Paul was so excited about in Ephesians 3? It's this right here, what Jesus is going to say. He says, many will come from east and west, east of Israel and west of Israel, and they'll sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I think the Jewish followers are going to handle that. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And a servant was healed that same hour. Give me a break. Okay? Look at that. Celebrate. You know, th this is you and I we're talking about. This is our Gentile story. Okay? We see as far back as Rahab that we see in Hosea. God says, you know, these people that are called my people will not be called my people, and the people that are not my, called my people will be called sons of the living God. Okay? And then Paul says this at the end of Romans 11. I can't help myself, so here I go. The end of Romans 11 is the end of 9, 10, and 11 that Calvinists think are all about Calvinism, right? But check this out. Here's how Paul summarizes these highly Calvinistic verses. He says... Don't get proud, Gentiles, that you've been included in because God cut off the natural branches from the vine, the Jews, because of their unbelief, not from any other reason. He said, because of their unbelief, they were cut off and you were grafted in as a wild olive branch into the vine. And you'll stay in the vine as long as you continue in belief. But if you do not continue in belief, you will be cut off and God will graft in them if they stop their unbelief. They'll be grafted back in again. Okay? Based on belief and unbelief. That's why I get fired up about this stuff, right? It's based on belief and unbelief. And it's not a work. To say you believe is not saying I believe in salvation by works. It's saying I believe in salvation by Faith in Christ alone who did all the works. But if I don't believe, then I'm not included. Isn't that how it works? I can feel people getting mad, but that's all right. Now, here's how I want to finish with about a 30-minute lesson in 16 minutes. Here we go. This is my favorite picture of this whole thing. My favorite picture in the whole world about this. We're going to go to Acts 8. And... Um, I want to start by saying this. If you've ever taken my Christ in the Old Testament courses, you've heard this. Um, but you know about the flood. You know about Noah and his three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, coming off the boat. And now they're given the creation mandate of uh, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, right? So all of us come from Ham, Shem, or Japheth. Everybody on the planet comes from one of those three guys. Now, Jesus says, get the gospel out into all the world, beginning in Jerusalem, and then out to Judea, and then out to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth, right? This progression of salvation, going from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. Now, in Acts chapter 8, we meet an Ethiopian eunuch. He's Ethiopian. He's African. He's a Hamite. Ham would be his ancestor that got off of Noah's boat. Then we go to Acts chapter 9, and it's Saul of Tarsus. He's a Jew. He's going to be the Apostle Paul. He's a Shemite. Then we go to the next chapter, Acts chapter 10. We're going to meet Cornelius, another Roman centurion. He's Italian. He's a Japhethite. All three of these men get saved in back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back chapters, Acts 8, 9, and 10. It's a Hamite, 
followed by a Shemite, followed by a Japhethite. They're salvations. You see the Gospels for the whole world. Those three men represent salvation for the entire planet. Everybody's included because what about the Hamites? Look at the eunuch. What about the Shemites? Look at Paul. What about the Japhethites? Look at Cornelius. And all three of those salvations take places on roads leaving Jerusalem. Get the gospel out from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Acts 8, the eunuch just went to Jerusalem to worship, and now he's coming back from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia. He's on a road leaving Jerusalem. Acts chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus is on the road to Damascus, out of Jerusalem to Damascus. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius has said that he lives on a street called Straight. That str street goes out of Jerusalem into um, wherever he is. Joppa, is that what he said? That's uh, Jonah. All right, so anyways. So you have representatives from all population groups of the world, Hamite, Shemite, Japhethite, all on roads getting out of Jerusalem, just as Jesus said, get the gospel out of Jerusalem. So there it's going to all people. Now for the remainder of our time, I want to focus on this Ethiopian eunuch. Picking up in Acts 8, 26. It says, Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes, where? From Jerusalem to Gaza. It's a road leaving Jerusalem. It says, This is a desert road. Deserts are dry and barren, correct? This is, so now we have a barren land in this story. So he arose and went, and behold, the man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now here's a Gentile going into Jerusalem to worship. When he gets to the temple, he's going to come across a wall that we talked about in Galatians. Remember when it said Jesus broke down the walls of separation. I brought up this wall that kept Gentiles from getting too close to the temple with a sign on it that says if you cross past this wall, you're responsible for your own death, right? So this Ethiopian, plus you had to be whole. Ethiopians are, are castrated. So because of his castration and because of his Gentile uh, ethnicity, he would have been prevented from going into the temple to worship. He would have been kept at a distance. Yet now he's coming home from that experience. And he's sitting in his chariot and he's reading Isaiah the prophet. So what do you do when the people in the church reject you? You go on Facebook, criticize the church, and become an atheist, right? Okay, well this guy says that wasn't God's fault, that was man's fault. So I'm going to start pursuing God again. I'm reading my, my prophet Isaiah. Then the Spirit said to Philip, see the personhood of the Spirit? He's speaking now, right? Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, do you understand what you're reading? Now, how many of you felt like this? He said, how can I unless somebody guides me? I felt like that before, right? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. Notice how the Bible, the Holy Spirit, wants you to know exactly where this eunuch was reading. It's going to give you the passage of scripture that he's reading. Here it is. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, do you think that eunuch was just humiliated? In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? So, uh, who will declare his generation? Is, uh, he's going to die without children. He's not going to have generations to declare. He'll die childless. What do you think a eunuch feels about that? I have something in common with this guy. I'm going to die childless. This guy's going to die childless. For his life is taken from the earth. That's what he's reading. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? He wants to know, who's, who's this guy who's going to die without kids? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning at this scripture, what scripture? This is Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. So beginning with Isaiah 53, 7 and 8, he preached Jesus to him. It should be your goal to be able to preach Jesus Christ from the Old Testament. When he's walking with the Emmaus Road disciples after his resurrection... 
It says, he taught about himself beginning with Moses and all the prophets. Moses doesn't mean Exodus 1, it means Genesis 1, because he's the author. So Jesus is taught throughout all of Scripture. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, but it's these that speak of me. You imagine a man saying, all you ever studied in your Old Testament studies is me. It was all about me. So now, he, so now Philip is preaching Jesus beginning in Isaiah 53. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. How'd this story start? It's desert. It's barren. It's waterless. And he's already been down this road. He already went down this road to get to Jerusalem. Now he's coming back and there's water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. Now he says, what hinders me from being baptized? And my question is always this. With all the excitement going on in this chariot, it should certainly read, the eunuch said, look, here's water. Baptize me. But he doesn't. He said, look, here's water. What's going to hinder me now from being baptized? Because I just got hindered from worship, didn't I? So what are these obstacles that are in my place where now I can't get baptized, even though I think God brought this water here for me right now? Because it ain't rained in the desert, and it wasn't here when I was coming, and now here it is. And it's enough water that both of them will go down and submerge themselves in there. Sorry, Presbyterians. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now why is he saying what hinders from me being baptized because it's all he has experienced as a Gentile man is hindrance from his faith right so what's going to hinder him now from being baptized then Philip said if you believe with all your heart you may all the walls of hindrance just came crashing down with that statement there are no walls to separate anybody from God. Here's the three words that always come up, if you believe. All the walls are gone now. Ask Rahab. Ask Ruth. Ask them how against all odds they're in the family of God in heaven today because they said, I believed. Now, are we to get rid of our gospel to save by grace through faith alone? No. What do they believe? And the 100% work of Jesus Christ. He did it all. He did it all whether you believe it or not. So if you don't believe it, then you don't participate in it. Just like if I laid out a buffet for you and said, hey, this is for you. If you go, I don't believe it, then I go, then you're not going to enjoy it. What can I tell you? doesn't mean I didn't do it all for you. just means if you don't believe it, then you don't, you don't get to partake of it. So what, if you believe with all your heart, you're made. And the answer says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Belief erases all the impediments of the law. It's why you're free. That was the whole book of Galatians we just studied. You're free because you believe. It's in here several times in a few sentences. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. I am going to ask Philip how that felt. He's literally transported before this man's eyes. But here's the thing. When you, you experience what the eunuch experienced at the temple, you're coming back, you're faithful enough to stay in the Word of God instead of criticizing the church. You're going to have this messenger sent to you you're going to have a body of water prepared for you. You're going to see all the impediments vanish in your life. You're going to receive baptism. And then it says this, and he went on his way rejoicing. He went on his way rejoicing. If you would have saw it at the temple, you would have said, this man's having the worst day of his life, that poor guy. And now this guy forevermore is going to say, that was the best day of my entire life. It's the best day of my life. He went on his way rejoicing. Now, you want to know why he went on his way rejoicing? Go to the scripture he was reading, Isaiah 53, 7. Can we safely assume that if he gets rejected at the temple and he still continues to read Isaiah, that now that he has this apostle show up, he has water appear for him, he receives baptism, he knows all the impediments he experienced are now gone. Do you think he might read his Bible the rest of the way back? 
Well, let's see what he would have read. Okay. He was in Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. And then you're going to get it all. He's, he's going to read in, in 10, 11, and 12 the beatings that the Lord took on his behalf and all of that. And then I want to go to chapter 54. And for time's sake, we're just going to cover a couple verses in the next couple chapters to see what this man would have read. Chapter 54 says this, Sing, O barren one. Okay, so now is this fitting for him? See a barren one? Okay. Now he's called to sing. Sing, O barren one. Wait a minute. I just went to worship at the temple and I was told I couldn't sing. I couldn't even come close. Now he reads his Bible and says, No, sing, O barren one. You who have not born, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You who have not labored with child, that's me too. Okay? I'm without child. It says, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. This is a head scratcher now. What do you mean? The barren's going to have more children than the, than the married woman. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. Why? You got lots of kids coming. Get a bigger tent. Chapter 55, verse 1. It says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Listen, you should always stop yourself when something just doesn't make earthly sense. You who have no money, come and buy? I want the broke people to come here and buy something, he's saying. Come to, if you thirst, come to the waters. If you have no money, come and buy some stuff and eat here. Yes, come buy wine. That's the sign of your joy. And milk, that's your sustenance. Without money and without price. What do you think the wine and the milk stand for? Your joy and your sustenance. It's, your, it's a gospel message. What's it say about the gospel? It's entirely free. Right? It's entirely free. It's life everlasting and joy everlasting. It's totally free. And we don't have very many buyers. Why do you spend your money for what's not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy. Think of the thousands of things in your life that fit that category. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight in abundance. All right, let's go to uh, 56 1. Actually, 56 3 will start. Okay, you're in the chariot with him. Read along with him in the chariot. Experience what he's experiencing. The amazing day that he's having, and he's reading, he says this. Thus, uh, Verse 3, do not let the son of the foreigner, is he a son of a foreigner? He's a Gentile, yes, who has joined himself to the Lord. Is he the son of a foreigner who just joined himself to the Lord? So this says, do not let that person, do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, speaking, the Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Isn't that exactly what just happened to him at the temple? He was separated from the people of God. Now, this says, don't say that, foreigner who just joined himself to this Lord, do not say the Lord has utterly separated me from his people, nor let the eunuch say, do you think he's going, God, I feel like you're talking right to me. Okay? Nor let the eunuch say, here I am, only a dry tree. That was the insult that people would call eunuchs because dry trees can't produce fruit, nor can eunuchs. So that was the mocking that they would endure. Do you think God hears when you're mocked and responds when you're mocked? So I can tell you to turn the other cheek because vengeance is his, says the Lord. He will repay. Okay, so, so stop saying you're just a dry tree. Why? Because you read Isaiah 54. It says you better start enlarging your dwelling place because you got lots of kids coming, more than the married woman has. For thus says the Lord, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, even to them I will give in my house. What just happened when he went to the house of the Lord? Keep out, keep away. He says, listen, eunuch, don't be saying that stuff no more because now I'm inviting you in the house. Even to them I will give in my house and within my walls. It was the wall that kept him out, right? Stay out behind the wall. Now it says, no, I'm going to give you something within my walls. 
What am I going to give you? I'm going to give you a place and a name. I'm going to stop there for a minute. Because I'll never, ever forget in 2019, visiting Israel. The hardest thing to visit in Israel is the Holocaust Museum. If you think that's hard to visit them in the United States, go to Jerusalem and visit their Holocaust Museum. And it's called Yad Vashem. It means a name, a place and a name. It's named after what we just read. God says, I'm going to give to you in my house and within my walls a place and a name. So it's named Yad Vashem after that, after this. And the reason why they named their Holocaust Museum a place and a name is because the victims of the Holocaust weren't buried properly. They didn't get a proper place, and lots of them are nameless. So they're trying to give them a place and a name in this museum. This museum you can't get into until you walk underground. They're trying to give them a proper burial by having this museum underground. And then you'll see some of the most horrific video you've ever seen. Okay? I don't even want to talk about what, what you, you see in there. Okay? I'm not exactly a good promoter of going to this museum, am I? But you should go and let yourself be horrified by this stuff. Okay? It's an absolutely remarkable thing. And that was the easy museum to go into. Because next to it is the Children's Holocaust Museum. Okay? And they know better to show you anything in that museum. It's dark in there. And you walk in holding a rail so that you can walk through the dark to get out the other side. You don't see a thing. But they're playing an audio recording naming every child they know died in that Holocaust their name and their age. So you just hear a child's name and their age. over and over again. It ain't Disney, I'll tell you that. But it's named after this in verse 5. Now he says, Even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. I'm going to give them an everlasting name. These, the, this eunuch who keeps my Sabbath and does what pleases me, who's been kicked out of, stay, stay out of my walls, stay out of my house. No, come in my house, come in my walls. I'm giving you a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters, an everlasting name that will not be cut off. Now, this Ethiopian goes back to Ethiopia and... You've heard of Christians in Ethiopia. They're called the Coptic Christians. And I remember in 2014, 2015, you saw Coptic Christians on TV all the time. And you would see them on TV because they would be in these orange jumpsuits on the beach, on their knees on the beach. And there'd be guys dressed in all black behind them called ISIS. And ISIS had these big machetes in their hand. And they would one by one just lop off their heads. They're trying to get rid of the Coptic Christians. Christianity. Because if you look at Africa and how Islam has taken over that continent, up there in the northeast section near the Horn of Africa is the Coptic Church. It extends into Egypt. And it still stands today. These churches in that region, Christian churches stand in the region. Islam has not been able to take them down. And if you trace their ancestry back, and say, who's in charge of this Coptic church? Who was in charge before that? And, for, and you get to their founder, they point to this eunuch as their founder. And he was given a promise that he'll be given a name that'll never be cut off. It's an everlasting name. And, if, and they have a title for him. The title they call him is the father of their church. He's their father. And this is a promise that he'll have more children than the married woman. So he's had, over the last 2,000 years, millions of people call him dad. You're our father. It's the literal fulfillment of these texts in this man. And the remarkable thing is the Bible presents where he was reading in Scripture so you could join where he's reading so you could see what he read. And here's how the Bible sums it all up. It says he went on his way rejoicing. Okay. That's a celebration of Gentiles, isn't it? For heaven's sake. 
You better say yes, because I don't have any more. Back to Ephesians 3. Last two verses. <laughs> Here's why I waited for these two verses. Did you hear what we just talked about? Did you hear Paul's enthusiasm, excitement, and saying, I just hope God gives you the ability to understand this. That was his prayer in Ephesians 3. So I want God to give you an ability to understand this stuff. And then we see what we just saw, and he finishes this. Now to him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Whatever you think, it's better than that. He's able to do exceedingly above, abundantly above all that we can ask or think. Do you know him that way? However your prayers got answered is better than the way that you asked them. They were never unanswered, by the way. They were just answered better than you intended. Does that mean you can see it? No. Because then you're not walking by faith, are you? And there's no trust in that, is there? But he's able to do exceeding abundant more above all we could ask or think according to the power that works in us. Figure that one out. He can do more than you can possibly imagine through the power that's in you. So can you imagine all these excuses why people don't go to church and they're not involved in their church and they're not being active Christians out there in the world, missing the promise that he'll do more than you can imagine through the power that's in you. And that power just sits at home and does nothing so much. So Tuesday night, we have a men's study that's noticeably smaller than the women's study. We want to fix the problems in the country. I promise you that'll come after the men start showing up for stuff. To him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. 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 Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, just do a, do a work, Lord, that is more than we've ever asked for before. Make us willing servants, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.